welcome everybody to another Mutations podcast. It has been a minute and I'm very excited to be here today with Nora Bateson. Uh, I am here with Maimuna Moosley and John Freeman. And we have a few other folks who may or may not be joining us as we stream today. Uh, but this conversation was catalyzed by Nora's initial Facebook post about stages being colonial bullshit and the provocation that ignited through different Facebook communities. Um, Hansi Freinacht, Daniel Gortz had responded and there was an interesting exchange there as well as a kind of eruption of commentary, reflections and other posts all throughout social media. And uh, it, there's really no way we could do this conversation justice in a single panel. However, I figure we need to get the conversation started. And so uh, we will see whether uh, Daniel can join us particularly today for this panel if that will have to be scheduled in the near future, but I wanted at least a few of us here today uh, to begin to talk about this topic. And so maybe we can kind of do a little mini round table here, just a little mini introduction. Um, Nora, I wanna int introduce you and just say it's an honor to have you on the podcast on mutations. It's been a long time coming. I've uh, been anticipating this one way or another and um, I'm kind of excited that this is the way it happened. So I wanna welcome you and then we'll go around and do some introductions. So. Thank you so much, Jeremy. It's great to be here. It has been a long time coming, so I, I'm looking forward to it. Excellent. And Maimuna, I wanted to say hi. And we were friends already on Facebook when when Nora suggested you for the for the panel. Uh, and I forget the context in which we were friending each other, or what node or what part of the network linked us. But I uh, want to welcome you as well. And if you could just do like a brief little intro and, and what you do. Um, and, and and what attracted you to to joining us here today, other than the invitation? <laughs> Thank you very much, Jeremy. I am so thrilled uh, to be part of this conversation, and thank you, Nora, for inviting me to be a part of this interesting. And I think it is absolutely, absolutely timely. Whatever context we had in 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 the Facebook, I think. You know, um, we are so transcontextual. We do not know exactly which context, but I'm so glad I'm connected with this group. Excellent, fantastic. And John, uh, we have interacted a bit. Uh, I just friended you this morning, as of this morning. Uh, you're kind of on call, and and Nora had suggested you uh, for this panel as well. So we've interacted a bit before. Welcome to Mutations Podcast. Maybe you can give folks a few words about what you do and and, and your context. Well, <clears throat> thank you for the invitation, and uh, yeah, good, good to be here. Um, context, I guess, my own background, uh, just talking about the last fifteen years, has been crucially, from this the point of view of this conversation, uh, in my work with spiral dynamics, and so uh, clearly the challenge to stage theories was pretty centrally a challenge to how I think and everything I do. And beyond that, I guess I am uh, I have a, a deeper interest in the nature of uh, human beings and our relationship with the world and wrote about uh, the context of science and how our reality is created and what we consider that a reality to be and um, I mean that book The Science of Possibility is also part of my frame of reference uh, for and, and I considered it and I think Nora sort of at least to some degree accepted it as a, a kind of a Batesonian book in its way of looking at the world and so that's what encouraged me to uh, be here and to be as engaged as I have been with the Facebook conversation. Excellent, excellent. So I've been working with um, warm data and uh, Batesonian thinking um, in particular, um, looking at ways in which uh, culture and um, existing ways of perception are, uh, are brewed through abductive process, and um, and what what is change? What what you know? Kind of what is? How are we perceiving life? And and what is change? What is system change? How might we begin to formulate a relationship to that? 
idea that is not necessarily located in the existing system. So that that's kind of my my place in, in my work and what I've been doing for the last, well, I don't know, three generations actually. <laughs> so um, so that's those are my questions. And um, my, my, you should give a little context on your work too. Uh, uh, yes, thank you, Nora. Um, I am uh, a trained psychotherapist, uh, trained in the West and have been practicing, um, you know, uh, some of these ideas and some of these theories uh, back home in, in, in Singapore. And, you know, where we are culturally, I am now very, very interested because of the, I think we have to blame Nora for it. A lot of the time I would blame Nora for it, for, you know, um, uh, creating an up, quote unquote uprising the need to actually even question where is that where is that idea coming from and then really I'm I am I'm at the place where I am very very keen to even question you know the role of spirituality the role of religion and the role of um, culture in the way we are doing what we're doing because I think that's 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 the that's a crucial question because otherwise you know I think a lot of the things that we're doing at this point is very much um, um, mechanized. So, so I'm I'm very very interested to to whenever I hear things like you know that seems to elude that idea that okay this is the way to go. Uh, step one two three, stage one two three. I'm I you know it gets me a tight bit a tad bit riled up. So yes, I am so keen where this conversation is going. Excellent, excellent, and that's that's the the key tension I think we're exploring here. Uh, with my own context, my listeners are mostly familiar with that, for, but for folks who are coming in, for me, I'm coming in at this through Gene Gebser studies and integral studies. And Nora, I have a bit of a overlap with our own lineage in terms of the Lindisfarne Association. And, and I, I was corresponding with Bill Thompson for, for many years during my graduate work. So I feel a, a certain kinship and, and, and spiritual lineage with, with what the Lindisfarne Association was doing. So uh, this is the interesting tension though, right? Which is uh, when you were calling out on Facebook, stage theory is colonial bullshit. You're particularly, and I wish we had uh, Robert here for this round, but maybe for the next one. Um, uh, Robert, who, who is posting about this as well, and, and you, you and him also had a conversation that will be posted on Mutations, uh, Robert Conan Ryan, that this is in the context of Piaget, um, developmental psychology, right? And, and to what degree do these stages of human development, um, uh, can, to what degree can they be applied universally to all human cultures, first of all? And then second of all, the pinpointing this historically, it's context, let's say with eugenics, uh, the, the sort of problematic colonial history, you were bringing up particularly the importance of the context in which these theories arose in terms of industrialization as well and productivity and making more productive human beings for those things. So, so there's so much context and history swimming in the origins of developmental and stage theories um, in the context of psychology that it, it felt important to at least bring that up, right? And then, you know, just in the context of this field that we're swimming in, integral theory, stage-centric theories, et cetera, um, they're working with this sometimes consciously, sometimes maybe not if we're talking about Facebook groups and, and what's being bandied around, everyone calling each other particular color-coded stages of development as, as pejoratives perhaps. Or, so, so there's a lot that we're swimming in here in this context. And this isn't exactly a question per se, but maybe like a good soup to begin teasing apart and exploring together. And I don't know, Nora, if you wanted to add more to that context or to clarify, and then maybe we can jump to John too after. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it, for me, I've been really curious about this particular moment in time between the kind of late 1700s and mid 1800s. And um, this is sort of the beginning of the industrial era where we're switching from coal to oil, things are moving faster, Gaussian statistics is created, um, the factory is part of the society, the society is part of the factory, education starts to mimic the industrial model of the assembly line, the assembly line is, is getting mixed up in identity and language, um, there's all kinds of things that are happening in multiple contexts in that moment. Uh, and 
So part of what is interesting to me about this and important is recognizing where those epistemological traps are. You know, it's easy enough to just point to evolutionary theory and say, of course, there are stages. Um, but there is, I think, some very important teasing to be done around um, why are we thinking those thoughts? Where did they come from? And, and the, the, there's, a, I think, a very interesting and important kind of historical spot there where uh, way before World War II and Hitler and the version of eugenics that we know, um, eugenics got its start. So eugenics actually started in the, 18, the end of the 1800s. And it was absolutely um, part of this question of how do we optimize the human being? How do we make the best human being? Because this was part of the, the thinking around the factory of how to get raw resources into product, how to get the laborer to the owner, like the, the versions of hierarchy that the, that the industrial world kind of uh, leaned into. Okay, so, so I'm not against hierarchy. Let me just say right away, there's nothing wrong with hierarchy. It's very old, it's, but the old ones were cosmological. Um, they, they have issues too, you know, slavery was definitely justified through those cosmological hierarchies. But, but I guess the interesting thing for me is this way in which eugenics, statistics, the school system and language, the notion of how to be a better parent, how to be a better citizen, right? The whole idea of eugenics was about how to make the better human being. And and at this point in, in where we're sitting, uh, this is a moment in time where we're looking at new IPCC reports that basically say, we, if we don't change the way we're living and the way we are perceiving ourselves, each other and the world we live in, um, that it's, a, it's actually a survival question at this point. So how do we make that change? Coming back to the systems change question and thinking about the ways in which even our understanding of ecology, of, of biology have been um, shaped through the last 150 years. I mean, since ever really, but let's, let's say, you know, I'm putting this industrial era in focus. Um, by efficiency, speed, betterment, optimization, Right, and, and we know the violence that came out of that and eugenics got shut down, but it had already infiltrated um, child development, education systems, um, all sorts of social systems. And um, in ways that, you know, if you look at the history, it's super frightening. And then the language and the, the place of it got kind of, polished up to fit a more politically correct version. But I guess for me in my work and where the, the adamance and you know what that post is, is actually a cry for nonviolence. It's the, this, this feeling that I have been working with for so long. It's in all of my work since ever, um, if you look at it, that I, I will never, identify another person based on a stage or a label or a tag. I, I would never suppose that I could understand whether I was talking about that person or their microbiome or their family or their culture or their, how would I know? Hmm. And I, I think that that for me is the the violence of stage theory is the assumption that you can have some objective, um, objective criteria through which you could assess another person. And um, I don't see the benefit in that. Yeah, that's a very good and clear position and opening, I feel. And, and I would like to turn, if that's okay, uh, to, to John as well, because John, I would like to hear a bit more from you just on, on the other end of things, right? There's a lot of readoption of stage theory, particularly in the integral spiral dynamics, meta-modern community with some of these 
caveats and 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 um, cautions in mind, right? I think they, a lot of folks have talked about the history of colonialism and uh, dominator hierarchies versus natural, and and just so many other disclaimers that have been brought up. But I I would like to hear maybe more from you and, and how you articulate this and acknowledge and respond. Thank you. So um, I'll start by saying that there's a kind of, I don't know, 98-99% agreement from me to everything that uh, Nora has said. Um, there's no dispute about the history, there's no dispute about what it's done to language or how we've applied it in education or wherever. And for me there's no question that whatever the conversation we're having here, that history uh, still inhabits huge portions of the world, which is still thinking in those same terms. So, you know, for, for me, the, the question has to do with, well, what, you know, the, the crucial question is what, what can we change? How can we change it? And whether any kind of uh, formulation that has to do with development or stages of development assists with that future in a positive way. So to make it totally clear from my point of view, there is no such thing as better types of human being, uh, but there is a goal to find out how we individually and collectively be the best human beings that we can. And I think maybe it's really important that I make it very clear the extent to which the grave spiral dynamics perspective and the use of uh, colors uh, is not even to the slightest extent, a description or an, it's, it's not saying these are types of people. So it's a conversation about the ways that people think, the ways that we each classify what's important to us and what underpins the choices that we make in our lives. It's not prescriptive of how anybody should be. And nobody operates, or all these operating systems, they coexist in all of us. And so we are, one expression is that we are chords, not notes within that scale of colors. But it goes deeper than that because we are not static. So we are actually more like, um, you know, an improvisatory piano composition where those chords are changing. And they're changing because they are different in different contexts and for different reasons according to what we each need. And so whenever people start to use colors in a way to identify people, there is a sense that, yes, e we each individually tend at any given time to be uh, occupying a certain position within that range and that there is a kind of center of gravity to that description. And we have a tendency to use that in as a, as a convenience, but in what is also easily um, an oversimplification to say something about that person, because to go into the depth of the description and all the acknowledgements of everything that Nora has referred to all the way down to microbiome or whatever, just would make conversation difficult. Nevertheless, there is a process that is taking place with, within those ways that people think that has to do with the tensions that arise between the different ways that people think. And what that means for how we 
best work with those differences, with the diversity and with the development of, well, what is next in terms of how we become better individuals or a better society. And the definition of better comes out of us. It's not an imposition from outside. Yes, excellent. <laughs> uh, this, I mean, this is sort of where we really wanted to get into it, right? Because that's the framing that I've that I have heard, uh, and so I, let's let's lean in. Um, Maimuna, I wanted to to circle to you and see if you have any immediate responses with that, in, in the context of your work, right? And I'm sure you've you've engaged with integral and spiral dynamics approaches before. So I'm, I'm curious how, how this lands in terms of its, uh, what John is articulating. I, I, I was eager to, to jump in because I felt, I, know, I, I was thinking in which, you know, in which aspect should I come in and, you know, respond to um, the, again, I'm responding from the inner side of me, of uh, a, both a practitioner, a human being, and also somebody who is really interested in learning about how we have learned. And, you know, um, and, and because for me, where we are at this point in time, the idea of stages is so deeply embedded that we don't even question how we know what we know anymore. You know, if, if, if you go to the schools in Singapore, for example, the kind of things that the teachers are using to describe where the students are is really based on their, you know, capacity and at which level the children are graded based on and, and you know, which direction they need to, uh, which direction they need to take. And also for us uh, who are practitioners working with families, for example, we are looking at, you know, it's really interesting how we use um, stages, for example, to, to measure the stages of risk. And we are also looking at how, for example, early childhood children, for example, are being uh, categorized. So, so it's, it's so embedded that, you know, for me, um, as an Asian Muslim practitioner, for that matter, you know, I ask questions around where did we learn? Where did we learn and how did we be, be, begin to believe that that's the stages? What about, for example, if you go to China and you know, look at the children in China, children at the age of six is able to carry the walk and start cooking. Where did that learning come from in that sense? You know, so it's not according, if you look at it, it's really not accordance to uh, Piaget's development or even Freud or even Erickson's theory of development. It's really not following that, but what's happening there. So when, when we are, you know, for somebody who's able to see or are given the opportunity to see the difference between how things are, are, are learned, how things are used and how things are utilized. And, and, and when you see a culture that actually develop based on multi ways of learning, you know, that creates a different um, 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 uh, need for me, for, for that matter, to begin to really um, a question. You know, how has stage theory staged the way we know? Because when I, when I hear Nora and John, you know, talking earlier, I was really bringing back, bringing myself back. I mean, I wasn't there during the time of our uh, independence, which is in the 1940s, for example. We didn't have the time to even consider what kind of knowledge has been brought into through colonization. Um, because, you know, we have been... Um, 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 we have been colonized by, by the British, as you may have known, you know, so our ideas of knowledge and our ideas of doing things is really something that we had to pick up and go immediately. So as a nation, that's what it is. And up to today, up to now, you know, the education system is still following. We need to get our GCSEs and, and, and stamped by, by, by London, not anywhere else. We don't have our own. So that really speaks about, you know, um, we have quote unquote colonial ghosts that we have never been, um, if I can say this, ready to even question. That's my immediate response. Yeah. And, and what I'm hearing from you is, is, is in the planetary context, in the international context, right? Or pluralistic context maybe development exists, right? In terms of 
unfoldment, uh, maturation. But that is so context and trans contextually dependent on that culture. It's people, mm -hmm. what yeah. those values are, how those, how those stages might unfold. And those stages might look very different. They might be inverted. They might be rearranged. So, and, and again, to bring up Nora's earlier point too, like hierarchy development, maybe there's ways we could articulate that. Um, and it sounds good on paper, right? Just in terms of understanding that, okay, we are not static. Um, this is more about, you know, centers of gravity where people are at or chords in a musical instrument. I, I don't mind that framing and all, but I'm hearing a kind of, well, maybe there are different instruments. And then the question becomes much more complex, but I wanted to circle to Nora now and just see, and then we'll go back to John and I will attempt to be a good facilitator and not chime in too much. <laughs> oh, uh, Nora, you, you're muted if you want to just there. There was a, um, uh, a, a lecture I attended recently by a, 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 someone who studied a lot of linguistics and history, um, David Olson. And he was talking about this moment in history where there was a shift in language and the shift that took place there was the shift between where people used to say uh, in, in the West, okay, I did, I'm gonna definitely culturally land this in the West. Um, I'm going to the store and buying bread. I'm going outside and picking peaches. I'm going to school and reading books. And then there was a shift Okay, the joiner words shifted and they became, I'm going to the store to buy bread. I'm going outside so I can pick peaches. I'm going to school to read books. And I think you can see that there was a whole lot that changed besides the words, right? And this shift again follows along this, the, the education system coming alongside the factory. And you get this uh, linear goal-oriented movement. Prior to that, I'm going outside, poof, that's the whole cloud of complexity. And buying bread, another whole cloud of complexity. And if I go to the store and I don't buy bread, I went to the store. But if I go to the store to buy bread and I don't buy bread, there's a failure. There's something that didn't happen that should have happened. There's a linearity, there's a goal-oriented process. So even in the idea of having a goal to be a better person, there is, I think, innumerable cultural influences of that period in time, which are inherently linked to the kind of efficiency and the epistemology of, of optimization, which is, as far as I can see, looking around the world, it's probably one of the most destructive things that we have going on right now. I mean, the irony is there, right? So efficiency is the exact opposite of flexibility. In, in, a, in a living system, in a complex system, when you optimize for efficiency, you rule out all sorts of other possibilities in that complexity. So that it, to, to achieve that goal, I'm going to the store to buy bread, okay? Now I'm no longer going to the store to meet people. I'm no longer going to the store to see how my horse walks. I'm no longer going to the store to be in the sunshine. I'm no longer going to the store to have a moment to myself. I'm no longer going, right? There's all of this other process that is poof gone. And so I guess my point is that I am deeply concerned about even the word development, frankly, um, because I think that it has implications that go back to this bettering and the bettering itself is attached to optimization, efficiency, productivity, and, and, and lacks. Um, even if I'm telling people, you need to learn how to see things in complex ways so that you can be more efficient at perceiving the complexity of your world. I would consider that a failure on my part. 
if that was the complexity I was teaching people, I would consider that to be um, a real loss, actually. So uh, I, I think that for me, I, I'm, I, we, what we have lost is patience. Mm. And the patience to perceive and to, to exist in relationship without this constant anxiety that you know is kind of the virus of the industrial age the virus of am i good enough is, is this person good enough am i better than them should i be better than them can they improve should i improve them should i improve myself ah, right there's this anxiety i want to get to number 5 i want to be turquoise i mean you 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 might hope that there's not a hierarchy in the colors or in keegan's numbers but there is and especially because my father had this, um, one of the criteria of the theory of mind um, is the criteria that, um, that the differences that get perceived become transforms or, and are coded into existing epistemologies. Okay, so, so the, whatever it is that I am perceiving, I'm only able to perceive it in terms of that which I am familiar enough with that I can grab onto it mm. and then it, it goes into my existing experience and confirms and reconfirms and alters and whatever the alchemy of that is but but the example that i usually use in my warm data course is when i moved to sweden and we drove down the road my husband would say look there's a moose there and i couldn't see the moose but if I'm in California and, and I'm running down the trail, I can say, look, there's a rattlesnake. And my Swedish husband will say, where? So the, the thing is not that I can't see the moose. The thing is I can't see the nuances, the differences in the forest around the moose, mm. right? So if I could tell the difference between the moose and the forest, I could see the moose. If he could tell the difference between the rattlesnake and the gravel and the forest shadows, he could see the snake. The issue that I'm having and the reason that I am saying that I feel that stage theory is, is, is BS and it's colonial is because it, 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 we cannot hold it. The way that we are seeing our, the world we're living in is already completely contaminated with these hierarchies of gradation, with notions of betterment, with, um, I mean, from the factory, you know, what level are you at this? Have you got your third level certificate of that? Have you, you know, it's everywhere. And so... So when people talk about stage theory, it triggers that. And, and if, I mean, honestly, you know, John, that when you look in the spiral dynamics space, people are accusing each other and, you know, people in Afghanistan of being orange and yellow and, you know, they should be turquoise like us. And, you know, it's there. And, and I guess my point is, I don't want it to be there either. So is it, I guess the question really is, can we let go of stage theory? Like, what are we actually getting out of it that's so important that we're willing to take this risk? Because for me, it's not worth it. Like life after stage theory, fine by me. Um, you know, then I have to deal with people and I meet people and I meet the people. Hello, right? We're living in a world that's filled with epistemological traps that are prohibiting the possibility of actually perceiving each other's complexity. Mm. And those are labels. John, would like to uh, hear from you and then we'll hear a little bit from Maimuna before uh, the top of the hour, because I know you have to bow out at that point, Maimuna. So yeah, John. Okay. Um, so let, before I get into what Nora has just said, let me first respond to uh, my Muna and to education just to clarify where I stand in relation to that because I my youngest son 
uh, went through Waldorf education for precisely the reasons that you describe uh, as being the closest I could get in this arena for, to anything else. And he did know GCSEs. Um, and he's now at university. So kind of he survived that in one way <laughs> or another. So, I mean, I hear everything that you're saying, Nora, and I feel there is still something that is missing if we completely follow that way of thinking. So, yes, I, I get what you're saying about language and making the bread the purpose and of framing everything in that narrow context. And nevertheless, there is the fact for me that when somebody uh, has the perception, I want some bread, there is something arising from them that is kind of also a part of how the purpose is seen. And there's a paradox for me around efficiency that I actually have the belief that flexible systems would be, if properly understood, more efficient. They would, they would be better uses of hu human energy than any of the things that are currently imposed on people in the name of efficiency, which actually are inefficient. And they're inefficient because they measure some things and not others and they don't measure they don't they don't assess the whole and so there's you know there is yes there is an inbuilt problem with all those ways of thinking and all the kind of um, epistemologies that you're describing um and the challenge is for me that there is a distinction between recognizing that there are differences and making judgments based on our perception of what those differences are and on taking that into kind of exclusions or beliefs that people are in some percent some sense inadequate for being who they are and um, that there's something taking place in addition to everything that is the, that is being described or everything that you described, Nora, which has for me a degree of urgency, which kind of uh, it sits in an interesting tension with your plea for patience, which is that it does appear to me that the uh, conditions we're facing as a species and as a planetary ecology have some degree of urgency in us finding solutions. And so there's a kind of, there's a time aspect to this. And without wanting to turn the perception of how we see and how we form our values into a hierarchy, there is at the same time a sense that, well, all organisms, if, uh, they evolve to adapt to the nature of the context that they're in or you know, the environments that they're in. And that in that process, there's actually a blend of um, kind of competition for resources and collaborative underpinning that everybody is dependent on everybody else or everything is dependent on, on everything else that actually sits as a as a natural tension within the system so there is <clears throat> there is no whole that exists independent of its parts and the notion of kind of of violence actually is it there's a certain sense in which because th those tensions are built into the living systems that you can always describe say a predator prey relationship or 
the way that a fungus feeds upon something in its environment, you can see that as violence or you can see it as not violence. I mean, it's just it's just part of what is. And OK, I can I can see that you're you're uncomfortable with that expression. But what I'm saying is that whatever is going on, each organism is doing the best it can with what is available to it in its environment. And so there's and there's something that then exists within that context where the whole context, the whole of an ecology actually does become more complex by virtue of those, the sum of those adaptations. And so there's something in the perception of how humans think that is also part of our adaptation to our environment and dealing with complexity is part of the adaptation that is being called for from us simply by the nature of the world as it is. My it's totally your turn, but can I just address something really quickly? Yes, go ahead, um, Laura. Okay, so in our endless Facebook conversations, um, I have given this example of an ecology a few times, and I think it's a kind of an important piece because this, this relationship to the notion of an ecology is really important to this question of stage theory. And it, it, we really can't have the conversation without it. And um, there's this beautiful description that my dad gave of an ecology where he talks about the deer's antlers. And, you know, the deer, the male deer grows antlers. And those antlers have a lot of different places in the ecology. They are transcontextual, mm. right? So the antlers um, do not serve one purpose. The deer is not necessarily about the deer. So the, the antlers are there and they are, you know, the, the, the deer can defend himself and they, they, he can have fights with other male deer or whatever. It's, it's there for, for defense. Um, the antlers are also there to attract the female deer. The antlers are there when that deer rubs his antlers on a particular bark, particular insects happen to be able to survive there. It, it instigates particular, catalyzes particular processes. There, there's ways in which when those antlers fall from the deer's head and he, he's gonna grow new ones, that, that they become food and homes for all sorts of other organisms. The antlers decompose and they become part of the mineral basis for the soil, for the bacteria and so on. So you can then ask yourself, where's the edge of the deer? Where's the edge? So when we talk about betterment, what are we bettering? And, and this is crucial for me in this question because in, and this is why the colonialism comes up, okay? Because the, the way in which there were other forms of knowing, those other forms of knowing took into, um, now you see there's a language thing because I could say took into account, but do you see how that's the wrong word because it's gonna go back to measurement, which brings me back into the colonial mindset. So it, 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 it was in harmony with, in, in relationship with the world around it. And um, the, I am not even gonna to begin to venture to say that, that old ways of knowing I can see what we've lost because I cannot, I will never know. I, you know, I had a, a, a big dose of that um, once when I was working with a group of Taoists and they were talking about joy and all the Western people in the room thought that joy was something happy. And they weren't talking about something happy. They were talking about a form of joy that includes fear, includes anger, includes remorse, includes confusion, 
And that it wasn't at all about that joy that's a happy face emoji. It was a completely transcontextual notion of joy. So in that moment, I, I really recognized, whoa, from where I'm sitting, this language that comes across to me, I can only receive through what I've got to receive it with, which is, you know, like it or not, 150 years of industrial measurement and, and education, getting back to this ecological question. So it's really tempting to talk about the evolution of the particular organisms. And in fact, a good deal of evolutionary biology has done so. Um, my grandfather um, in the late 1800s started saying, this isn't a good approach to this because if you do this, you're gonna study hereditary as a linear hereditary um, change as a linear process. But what you will miss is the way in which all these organisms are changing in relationship and to each other, with each other, from each other, through each other. Which brings me to abductive process. All right, abductive process is one of those pieces of systems theory that gets left behind. And um, I don't really see how you can do complexity without it, but people do. And it becomes very mechanistic. And abductive process starts with Charles Saunders Pierce. And it's basically this idea that what you can perceive in one context, you use that perception and you, it helps you to understand another context. Now, this is true at certainly a cognition level, but also in a biological, physiological level. So the heart is, a, is another, is a description of the lungs, right? So the heart's pumping, the lungs move. There's, they're, they're reflecting each other. So the way my father described abductive processes is that it's the way one context describes another. Um, so when we're looking at that, that description of ecology of the deer, what we're looking at is abductive process. That the insect in the bark becomes a description of the deer. Mm. Do you hear where I'm going here? Right, so that those organisms that feed on the particular decomposingness of the decomposing bits of the antlers that are under the soil become a description of the deer. Where is the deer? Who's bettering? So in a factory, that's not the case. You can identify the piece, you can change the piece, you can better the piece. I mean, this is how individualism comes in, right? We're suddenly disrupted from the village, et cetera. So I'll stop there. Maya, it's definitely your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, 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 Jeremy, I just wanted to say that this is really, really, really an important you know, conversation that we need to be having because I think what I'm connecting with um, as a practitioner and, and also as a, as a being is this whole idea of, especially now post COVID-19 particularly, everybody is attempting to better things or in, in wanting to better things, I think we are only looking at similar way of doing which is looking for possibilities and I think the fear that I have to be honest with you when we talk, when we talk about possibilities we will then be talking about using this same frame of uh, excellence or betterment in that sense so be using the same frame instead um, instead of you know instead of possibilities you know I I am I am wondering what can be done uh, to generate the idea of pause ability instead of just possibility, because the pause ability requires a change of how we need to reorganize ourselves. You know, when there's tension between a couple, what needs what can change in that couple relationship is how the partner can actually learn how to pause you know, instead of trying to look at bettering the relationship alone. So I felt like, you know, the whole, the whole, um, the whole idea of management uh, is really sitting next to the idea of excellent and possibilities again. So I, 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 I feel like, you know, that kind of conversation is not helping us, uh, is not going to help us to actually look at how we sit next to complexity. 
I think the idea that you know uh, Nora has been talking about a lot more and has you know resonated with me um, um, is is how do you sit next to complexity and not just to whip it up and just you know um, uh, deal with the complexity because that's the easiest to be honest that's the fastest but may not necessarily be effective for the intergenerational learning. So I feel like you know. Um, um, I think to to you know I was attracted to your idea, John, earlier when you're talking about natural tension. You know, natural tension as we look at any any circumstances or the natural progression of things, but natural to who and tension to what? You know, so 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 that 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 that's that's really making me wonder whether you know whatever that we are trying to do is bringing us back to really what Darwin is really wanting to, to, to focus on, which is really the survival of the fittest. And I think that's not what our current generation or future generation would require. Yeah. Thank you, Maimuna. I uh, want to honor your time as well, Maimuna. And yeah, if you do have so to sorry. bow out, that's Yes, perfectly. I do. Yes. And I, again, once again, Nora, thank you for bringing me into this conversation. And I'm very certain that we can strike more conversations such as these over in this part of the world. Wonderful. Thank you, John. It was nice listening to you and, and everybody. I will have to leave and take my leave. Take care. All right. Take care. Thank you. Uh, and bye thank bye. you so much, Mai. Bye, Nora. Bye. Okay. We've got a few more minutes that we can uh, go go a little bit further. So, John, I want to give you a chance to respond, and and then I'll weave in some comments as as the conversation's tightening, and I think I could speak a little bit more. So, yeah. I guess I I I feel that some of the complexity in what's being described is you know if. <laughs> in response to what Maimuna said was, well, if you use the word natural, you know, there is a kind of question of, well, natural to what, natural to whom, natural to the individual or natural to the system. And I, I feel that my description of the ecology, uh, maybe it was uh, not as well expressed as it needed to be, but I don't actually think it is different than what you've described, Nora, because all of those details and nuances exist. And yes, of course, it can, you know, you can look upon it from the point of view that you can only, you can only see the deer when you're able to distinguish it from the surrounding forest and that everything is ultimately everything is connected to everything else and so what we formulate as distinctions are um at every at every point where we choose to do that we kind of narrow the picture in order to talk about a one feature of it and I don't see how we can do that. I don't see how we can not do that, even though that we know that the features are all interdependent and all part of each other and that the edges are kind of blurred and that from an ecological point of view, you know, the, the, the deer is just sort of something that is, I don't even know how to, to use an, an alter uh, my language to express what you expressed but that you know that the question of edges itself becomes relevant because we we do talk about edges the way that people make meaning of their lives the way that people uh think about themselves and about their environment. Yes, it's all filled with um, constructs, which may be, oops, my ears are falling off. It's all filled with um, um, so, sorry, something has just happened on my system that I need to stop. Is anybody else see, hearing a background 
No, you look fine no. and sound okay, fine. Okay, I will try Everything's to. Everything's fine. Um, carry on without, uh, even though it's happening. Um, so the way that people make meaning of their lives is that they have certain constructs that they apply to what they see and those constructs are ones that they have acquired and which hold all that they've been given from their histories and their upbringing and from everything that's in the culture and all of that is there and at the same time it's also individual it's also what they choose and so when i when I speak of possibilities, what I feel we're talking about are, are the ways that people make choices and what are the choices that are ahead of us as individuals and as collectives of what are we going to do now? And the different people have different frames for how they make those choices and that those frameworks actually don't all agree with each other and that somehow we have to be able to accommodate all those differences. So the question of development and of how those frameworks have arisen and what we've done with them is part of the, it's part of the data, it's part of the intelligence of the conversation, it's part of how we work and it doesn't cease to be present just because we are uncomfortable with the history or with the DNA. I mean, the DNA is not only about what's been there before, it's also, okay, what is it, what are we going to become? And so I, I guess the point of tension between us continues to be that my perception is that we reduce the availability of understanding knowledge data and uh, perceptual field by being unwilling to see what is there in terms of the things that have that have changed and what might be identified as a stage and to, and to take that and to, to incorporate it without making external judgments about it but but by allowing it to be part of the conversation and to expand as it needs to. Okay, thank you for um, that response, John. I, uh, I'm gonna pass the ball back to Nora in a second. I wanted to just bring up two things. One is, as we were speaking about the very word development, I was thinking about its origins in terms of its modern usage in the late 1700s um, as, as a way to begin to talk about developing a piece of land unfolding its potential in terms of its crop yield or resources, et cetera. But the original word itself means to unfold, like, like something that's wrapped in a cloth or wrapped in a box and you, and you open it up to reveal what's in. So it has a kind of unveiling or unfurling or unwrapping in a sort of older etymological context. And more in the industrial context, it became something very much associated with industrialization. Um, so just like, putting that in the context of the very language, speaking of language that we're using to be able to talk about something that you obviously, like you, John, and, and I think a lot of the interpolists recognize at some level, right? That development means more than that industrial framing, that things grow and change and transform. There's this overall ecological context to become anything is to become with. I mean, Donna Haraway talks about that with sympoiesis. Uh, Lynn Margulis has talked about that with uh, endosymbiogenesis, right? So there's this relationality that's always there. Um, my question, and, and also to pass the ball back to Nora in this context is, uh, given that things, beings, and cultures transform, um, I, I'm still kind of questioning the way in which we're we're framing that because you could say for instance trump voters had a particular center of gravity that we want to be able to identify i think you're stating like we should be able to identify where a, a, a voting demographics 
value system is coming from in order to understand them, in order to navigate this very complex, pluralistic, planetary context that we're in. So having identifying markers is very useful, very helpful. I'm not necessarily disagreeing that it might, it would be insightful, but, but how are we doing that framing? Because if we see it, let's say as, okay, they're at a center of gravity that's at blue meme or amber, and they're more religious, and they have this mythic membership association that Wilbur talks about. That's one way to look at it. But then if you kind of take the, another way of looking at it, which is still looking at, okay, what's, where's the orientation, the historical, you're seeing other dimensions like, okay, well, there's industrialization, um, there's globalization processes of economic disparity that are happening. There's the different currents of, let's say, Protestantism in the United States that are kind of weaving with that. And so uh, I guess for me, it's like, how are we framing these generalizations to be able to talk about these rightly, appropriately so, you know, sociological orientations? different languages, being able to translate all that. My question is, how do, how do we frame that appropriately? And is stage theory necessarily the best way to do that? I'm not sure, but that's my question. But Nora, I don't know if you wanted to jump in as well or, or had uh, thoughts before my comment for John. I mean, I think that's my question too. And I... I, what I am sensitive to um, after several generations of this, actually, um, because my grandfather was fighting eugenics at the turn of the century. And, um, and you know, this is long before it became a tool of the Nazi regime, right? Eugenics existed long before. And it, you know, it led to really horrible things. So that distinguishing, those distinctions are dangerous. They can really be used in bad ways, particularly if we're looking for the betterment. And um, I am working with lots of different people who are hoping to save the world in one way or another. And I cannot tell you how prevalent the notion is that if we could just come up with a model that we could implement on, glo on global societies that would be sustainable, that would be you know, complex, people could see complexity, that would be somehow more ecological, that would be whatever it is, that if we could just do that, we could actually get a change. And we don't have a lot of time, so we better come up with that model quick. All right. Now, the thing is, is that most of the ecological movement also has its roots in eugenics. You know, Hardin, who had that famous story about the lifeboat, you know, you're on the lifeboat and there's 100 people in the water and you have 50 seats. How are you going to choose who to be giving those extra seats on the lifeboat too, because you can only choose 50 out of 100. So how will you make the decision, right? This is a high school ethics question. This is a eugenics question, right? If that's the question we're asking is how to distribute resources, what we're asking for is some kind of rubric and justification for who deserves to live. Um, so the lifeboat question is bogus. It's a bogus question because, you know, if it if it's us, if it's if it's you and me and my and and you know we're all on this in the water together and we're trying to figure this out. Let me tell you, I'm not leaving you guys behind. We're figuring it out. We're going to find a way because you are not numbers. You are not stages of development. You are not size. 10 or large or medium or right you are that is not who you are and you know what else who you are with me is different than who you are with someone else and who you are with someone else is different to who you are with another someone else so the 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 possibility 
exists in that flexibility, right? But if you tell a group of kids, they have to answer this question of who gets on the lifeboat, you get all sorts of, they start to answer it. They start to say, well, this person's older, which means they don't have as much life ahead of them. So they're not as valuable. On the other hand, they have a lot more knowledge. We might need that. And they start to weigh out all these distinctions. Um, it, you know, that's the problem is that whatever the question is, is what will be the inquiry. And if the inquiry is around how do we, how do we, you know, how do we develop in relation to each other? Unfortunately, that will be the answer to, the, we'll, we'll find, we'll find answers to that. So, so this is why I feel that the sooner we move away from that, the better. Because the real question is, who is it possible to be? And, and I don't think anybody knows that. I, I don't see how we possibly could. And especially if we, if we are utilizing particular lenses that are defining. Are you metamodern? Are you postmodern? Are you modernist? Are you, where do you sit in this arc? It's like, I don't care where I sit, right? When, when this came up in the, in the chat, it's, I'm, I'm completely disinterested in that other than intellectually, it's fun to play with those ideas, but in terms of who I am or how I see you or how I interact, I mean, as an anthropological exercise, it's fun to play with that. But in terms of me and you in relationship, what I'm interested in is not what you said or what you didn't say but what it was possible to say, right? So we talked about that example of the, the uh, you know, the, the, the elephant and the blind guys and the, you know, the necessity of multiple perspectives that comes out of that. And, you know, for me, it's not about the multiple perspectives. The multiple perspectives are actually irrelevant. They're a consequence. The, the perspectives that they give are a consequence of the relationship that they have. So the question is, is not what did they, how did they describe the elephant, right? One guy says the tail is a rope and a brush and the other one says that the foot is a tree and the nose, the, the trunk is a snake. Irrelevant. But what, who are they to each other? Were they, you know, like I was saying in the post, John, were they, you know, at the pub getting drunk? Are they brothers? Are they, you know, do they, are they mathematicians? Do they, do they, um, have an existing humor that they're playing in, that those responses are playing into the metaphors of, right? The communication is not what is said, it's what it was possible to say. And so the, this is the real, the real criteria for me of, of how, how we go forward. Like what is it possible to say? And if we're caught in these existing distinctions, that have these roots that are located in very dark places and that trigger those, those cultural memories, whether you, whether you want them to or not, all you gotta do is look at the spiral dynamics community communication, it is all over the place. So maybe if we're asking a different kind of question, we can move away from the language that is so fraught with that history. Yeah, John. <laughs> so, I mean, ultimately, I think we're both interested in what is what what is it possible to be? And there isn't a disagreement about the notion of any of these things defining who you are. Nor is there any agreement disagreement about the idea that you know, Hardin's um, way of presenting the question, it, it preconditions the answer and it is in a sense bogus. At the same time, oh, and, and also to say that yeah, I also don't think there is a model 
that that will solve all our problems. Um, I certainly don't think that uh, the Graves model of human sociopsychology will solve it. And yet the problems don't go away. And the fact that, you know, the conversation that you witness in all its inadequacies on spiral dynamics uh, forums is a reflection of who people are and not of the spiral dynamics system itself. It's a reflection of the fact that, yes, people do have this tendency to want to see themselves as better or to you know to get into competitive spaces or, or i mean th these are endemic to human behavior and they they were always endemic to human behavior it's what it's what humans have always done so i would be super careful there i mean i i i would never say that i understood what human nature was or what was endemic to human nature because well, I, I think okay yeah. i mean i I, yeah. I hear i hear the challenge but you know that there's a great deal of history that evidences the notion that this is what people have done and i'm not saying that that's what people have to always do but I'm at the same time, I'm saying that some of what is occurring is a reflection of the actual tensions of existence and of these underlying uh, questions of individuality and collectivism and the underlying question of where does collaboration sit and where does uh, cooperation sit in the process of life becoming whatever life becomes next and so by the fact that we take away the language or that we completely reframe the question in some um, or even that we avoid the question doesn't in itself mean that we have actually helped ourselves make the choices we have today to make today and tomorrow as to how do we deal with our crises and how do we how do we deal with the fact that human beings are in conflict with one another right now and that is not seemingly a very uh, helpful way to be and most people kind of seem to have a, a, a belief that well it's not what we should you know Afghanistan is not our view of what the world ideally should look like so somewhere the questions persist and even if we change the language in which we ask the questions somehow we still have choices to make so I don't understand how your framing enables us to make those choices? I think it's not a matter of, you know, switching from, you know, microbrew beer to non-alcoholic beer. I'm not talking about, um, about using new language. I'm talking about recognizing that that whole way of perceiving was contaminated and that's a cultural learning you know that's why i hit that ball so hard because it's hard it is i mean it is i consider it a true violence to label someone to label yourself and to to commit those reductionisms on each other in a moment where what, what, you know, especially in terms of all the conflict that we're looking at, um, the, the, the refinement and the tag, you know, we're talking about this as though it's human nature. And this is exactly what I'm trying to get around here is that it's not about human nature. It's the epistemology 
of co colonialism and the last 150 years and all the language and ideas that are compiling from math to economics, to education, to religion, to substantiate that. And then we're like, oh, it's human nature. And I, you know, sure, people have been in conflict long before the industrial revolution. I don't dispute that obviously. Um, but, but what I am in dispute of is the fact that it would ever be possible to be in that form of district description and not tag all of those epistemological habits that, that, are, that are not mine and yours anymore, they're in the water. So it, it's like, you know, you have to be extra super careful. You know, I, I, right now, for example, you know, in racism, where there's a whole lot of stuff where, you know, you, you'd like to say, ah, I'm not racist. But what I don't know is the way in which the experiences of my life have combined to reconfirm particular ways of behaving that blind me, right? And so this is the thing that we're seeing everywhere and why I'm saying like, do you trust yourself? Because I don't trust myself. I do not trust myself to actually have an understanding of which moose I'm not going to see. I have no idea. So where I am at this point is recognizing there is a need to, to admit that the entire formulation of language and our ideas and everything else is, is at the very least in the alchemy of this um, premise, the premises of, of exploitation, of what's in it for me, of you know, taking what I can, of what about the self, right? All of these things, how do I better myself? That these things are, are deeply intertwined and that they, they are in fact, and, and they did in fact come, come careening in and gobbled up a lot of other kinds of ways of knowing and being that weren't efficient. And that's why I said it was colonial as hell because the, these ideas did come in and gobbled up all kinds of ways of knowing. And, and they continue to. Yes, they, they did. And they do and like you say they're in the water and yet I don't I mean it's all it's at this this point it it's it, it's become a question of survival um you know whether that's the survival of large you know, of billions of humans or whether it's the survival of, of the entire biological planet that that's you know an, an open question but it's still I mean it, it still leaves us with the the question of 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 the choices and I don't really see how we get away from the fact that we are all going to make our choices on the basis of some kind of criterion that we choose or that we have taken on or that we have within ourselves that are not definitions of who I am or anything else that they are simply this is what I can see to do so that you know the question of I can own I do I trust myself I can only trust myself to deal with the mooses that I can see and to allow for the possibility that there are also mooses that I don't see. But in the end, I have to make my choices and trust myself and trust my fellow human beings mm. to make the best choices that they can based on what they can see, which hopefully includes all the stuff that I can't see, or a lot of the stuff that we can't see. So that for me, the system that we're looking at has to 
encourage the notion that whatever the future is, it has to arise bottom up out of the natural intelligence of what is there. And all of the kind of interrelationships of the collective, whether they're, you know, individualistic or collaborative, whatever it, it has, it has to arise out of who we are. Exactly. I totally agree with that. Absolutely. A hundred percent agree with that. And the way that, that I see that happening is not by coming into communities or neighborhoods or groups of people and adding something. You don't have to add anything. They don't have to be taught how to see complexity. What they need are the conditions in which the complexity of their own life becomes visible. And, and so that's what the Warm Data Lab is all about. And it has absolutely no agenda, absolutely no goals, absolutely nothing that is in, in there because, because my version of complexity is totally different based on how my own life experiences are woven through it. And I will even see my own life experiences differently when I start to see them through different contextual lenses. So who am I? Just like who is the deer? You know, and and um, so I think that I absolutely agree that that there's, but but that's why for me it's so important not to define it. It's so important to leave that completely open, so that wherever someone is, their version of complexity is their own. It has not been predefined or described or in any way colored or numbered or anything else. It's just theirs. And, and what I find is that people who have, you know, absolutely no education, no prior experience with any kind of, you know, systems thinking or any of this are doing very, very beautiful and profound work with complex systems in a matter of a couple of hours. And they don't have any of the vocabulary of complexity. We don't bother with it. It's totally unnecessary, right? They know what complexity is, they live it. I am a complex system, so are you. So what do we need these levels and numbers for, except for to judge each other and ourselves? And so I, I remain convinced that the highest possible expression of love is to allow you just to be complex and never to name or tag or pin you down or in any way define you. Because you will be different in 10 minutes. You'll be different with someone else. So that for me becomes the integrity of, of being in relationship is holding that complexity wide open. And that if you are responding to the, the context of your life in ways that don't make any sense to me, that's another kind of question. Is that me not seeing or you not seeing or us not being able to share the, the mutual learning we're in? But it's a very different entry point, right? What is in the transcontextual mutual learning, right? When you have a crooked tree in the woods and you say, how'd that tree get crooked? Let's straighten it out is really different than if you are looking at where the water is and where the insects are and where the wind blows and where the shadows are. And you say, okay, how is this tree learning to be in its world? How am I learning to perceive and describe this tree? And that all of those things are in flux. So I feel like there's a lot to be gained by abandoning stage theory recognizing its place in history and recognizing that it was actually carrying too many dangerous ghosts and just moving on. You have all the tools of perceiving ecologically and, and in complex ways. What do you need the stage theory for? And uh, thank, you. thank you, Nora. John, I know we're, we're coming up at, at 90 minutes, um, but I just wanted to contextualize this as well. Uh, I just had a panel with the Integrales Forum on regenerative culture, regenerative theory. And we had Suzanne Cook-Reuter, developmental integral theorist, on with us. 
one of the interesting things that came up, one of the tensions actually is sort of answered by our conversation today, or at least I'm getting more insight from it, which is to be succinct and try to be brief here, uh, that we are in this existential crisis, right? Just materially speaking, there is a kind, there is an urgency in, in the present about really hurrying up to, to slow down, right? <laughs> to, to pause as, as Maimuna was mentioning earlier. And the question is, and this is something that Suzanne brought up, that yes, development shows up in the clinical papers and in the studies, and, and it, it's something, it's a criteria, and we could, that's a whole other conversation about mapping that and dem and, and, and uh, uh, case studies, et cetera, and how we're framing these tests, sure. But when it comes to the overall developmental framework, her predicament is the linearity of the stage theory. And I'm going to have her on as well for a one-on-one -on -one with me to talk more about that for, for mutations. But the question was, well, how do we get people to use second tier? How do we get people to integral? If only a small percentage of folks are at this higher stage of development, the, the, the usefulness of the theory, even if it is true, becomes insurmountable because you have to move the majority of the population up through this spiral or state-centric model to get to a position where they can be ecologically regenerative or see complex systems or be... And th that was the core tension, right? Which is a lot of spiral dynamics thinkers talk about the nonlinearity, the fractal, dimensions of the model. And so my question is, well, why not just lean into that? And that's always my question. Like, why do you need the linearity to begin with then? If, if it really isn't being used that way, and there's always these disclaimers about how it's so context dependent and people jump back and forth, but well, okay, let's frame it differently then, right? Um, so this is sort of an interesting response though, what you were saying, Nora, about actually complexities it's every, everybody can access that, right? This is a kind of ontological shift. All human beings have to be or are in the context of, of what we're going through um, is available to everyone. So when we're talking about becoming regenerative or becoming ecological or leaning into the conditions of the Anthropocene, I think it would be better to frame this as everyone has is in this context and will respond to it with their own complexity as Nora is saying. And I don't know if that's a stage necessarily. I, I, we could call it a transformation or a transition or, or a form of cultural evolution that is not using necessarily stages. So I'm more interested in that, in this regenerative turn and how everybody's on board with that. It needs to be, because if we have a linear model where there, we have to move through the sequence, then, then how useful is that model? You know, if that, we don't have the time to, spend a few thousand years to move everyone's center of gravity, right? So- Well, nor, nor should we. I mean, do you have time for me to answer? Uh, up to you, Nora. I know you, you have a schedule today. Go for it, John. Okay. I, I, got, I got four minutes and okay. then I gotta go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, no pressure then. Uh, okay, so I, I, will, uh, I will start by saying that the linearity or the sequence can be very misleading and that the notion that we have to move people or that even that people have to move themselves is completely spurious. We do not solve any of these problems by expecting that people have to move from where they are. The problems are solved when we allow them to be healthy where they are and where we create the conditions or help them create the conditions to be healthy where they are and we take away all the things that stop them being in conditions that allow them to be healthy where they are. So, you know, my, my perspective on, on who, who they are or who I am, in the, in the end, I, I may be aligned with in my language for what I think you described, Nora, about who I am is, I am the experience. And so that for me is kind of the potential for what all of us are. So then the, the, the question that is left is the one of, well, do, do the kind of descriptions and the labels and the sequences and the potential um, ways of looking at that, regardless of their historical contaminations, do they add anything to the information that is available to us 
to the data that is available us, to us when we are making our choices. And all I'm saying is that I believe they do, and that I believe that that is their value. And I understand that you see them as unnecessary, and you know, we, I can accept that, that that is something that we differ about. Um, but th that, nevertheless, that's that's where I stand. I think that I think that that is the value that they uh, they have. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 interesting. Just to close, I, I feel like we're both, well, Nora and and John, as we're concluding the conversation, we're coming around to bottom up. Context is relevant. How we're framing that. Is this, this open tension, open question? And certainly I think we're gonna to need to continue with further conversations and more <laughs> panels. And I'm sorry, Nora, about that. I know, I know you've, you've talked about it and infinitum on, on Facebook, but um, I, I think this has been very generative and insightful. And uh, I wanna thank you, Nora, for initiating this. And, and John, <laughs> thank you for stepping in and, and uh, joining us today. <laughs> I know it's like, I asked you to come on, like, hey, you wanna, Join a debate. You ready? Uh, in like ten minutes. Um, but but I, I hope it was more generative than just a just a debate. So I hope so too. And you My know, heart. John, that I send you lots of love. So you My know, heart. this this is like you know all all in the exploration of what is life and who are we in it. Um, so I think it's important to have these questions and. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I am honestly surprised by the response to this post because I really didn't think more than a 35 people would ever care. And um, so uh, who knew? This is the internet, right? Things go viral and you kind of never know when. I mean, two weeks ago, I posted something about community not being something that you build which I thought was far more controversial actually than this, because this stuff that I feel like the conversation we're having here is not new. Uh, I mean, you know, Margaret Mead was having this question, this exact same conversation with Frank Boas and the, you know, American Society for Eugenics around what is adolescence, right? Where it was defined as the biodeterministic stage in life and she said, no, it's not, that's a cultural definition. And she went and she studied these cultures and showed that adolescence is really different in different cultures. So I feel like we've been here a long time. So I was kind of surprised at the kaboof. And I, I know that it offended people and I, I really actually didn't mean that, um, but I did mean to uh, make a very clear cry for what I see as a, um, a call for uh, an end to a particular kind of violence of labeling in, in all kinds of fields, not necessarily pointing to spiral dynamics, um, but in all sorts of fields, because th that's not the only place where stage theory lives. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, any, any concluding thoughts, John, and then we'll wrap it up. <laughs> Well, there's there's a there's a, a little lingering thought about kind of the 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 violence of sort of being labelled as a bullshitter and and as a colonialist by by definition because of what I do, um, and I, I I say that with kind of with an acknowledgement. I know that I know that wasn't the attention, and I know I understand the provocation. And I understand all the reasons for it. I'm I'm just expressing it, I guess, as a, as what I see as the nature of what it is to have these conversations that that I still see that the you know that the that there is a conflictual process by which we arrive you know it's it, the uh, arrive at what we hope one day will be the you know the synthesis or whatever it is and you know I don't think I, I don't know that we can avoid that uh, difference and so you know I, I'm I am grateful for the provocation because I do think that underneath this is an absolutely crucial question about mm -hmm. the nature of what we are going to be and how we get there uh, and 
so I and I think maybe that that's why it's um, why it's triggered the the degree of reactions that it has. Yes. Yeah. Yes. For sure. And if you look around, like everything in my living room is produced through exploitation. So, I mean, I, there is as much colonialism in my day to day life as there is in anybody else's. Part of what has to happen right now is the recognition of this and you know it's painful if if i was a a detective with one of those black lights that shows blood you know and you went around my house and you to see the blood that that my belongings have caused in the world it would be like a like a like a you know serial killer lived here because it is so i cannot go around being defensive about the fact that the history that I came out of was violent. But what I can do is change the path. And, and I don't have any defense of it whatsoever. You know, people did what they did. Okay, that was a disaster. It cannot continue. Mm -hmm. yeah. Agreed. Uh, and again, thank you, Nora. Thank you, John. Uh, I think it's a good place to wrap it up here. So. Just want to say I'm grateful for you both and for my Muna um, yeah. and everyone else who's going to be talking in this series in the near future and 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 Daniel and Spirit <laughs> uh, when we come around to it I'm looking forward to that but yes thank you John thank you Nora it's been fantastic and yes very necessary conversation so thank you both thanks Jeremy thanks John thank thanks you. my Muna okay yeah, yeah. likewise.